Okay. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, sorry about the technical difficulties we had get going there. I think uh, Amy has some issues today. Uh, but very glad we can be here, and I'm extremely glad that we uh, have the opportunity to speak to Jesse from Variant Fund. Jesse, great to have you here. Yeah, excited to be here and excited to meet folks that are building uh, building profit sharing communities. Yeah, for sure. And and I think like for the context for the audience, um, one of the reasons we're so excited to have you here, particularly, is that you've just started a fund that's basically focused around I think you describe as digital digital cooperatives. But it, however you use the terminology, it's essentially right along the lines um, of what profit sharing communities are aiming at. And so I think you can be an amazing person to impart some kind of wisdom about like your thesis, but also where you see the space going, how you think is different from um, it, yes, essentially raising money for for normal normal businesses in the equity world. Yeah, and a whole bunch of other things. So uh, before we get into that, I guess like the, the obvious place to start is like, what's your background? Like how did you end up in crypto? And then specifically, how did you end up in our kind of interesting corner of DAOs in crypto? Sure, so yeah, I guess I have a pretty non-traditional background for, for um, a, a, a VC investor. So I, I usually start the story sort of way, way back as when I was a teenager, early 2000s, I was very involved with piracy. Um, and of course, piracy <laughs> was mostly taking place over you know, peer-to-peer -peer networks um, yeah. and protocols. And because at that time, like there was no YouTube, there was no Spotify, there was not even Netflix or there was, but they were mailing DVDs in the mail. And meanwhile, there were these sort of very organized communities um, that sort of coalesced around protocols like IRC and, and FTP mm -hmm. servers, um, mm -hmm. where you could literally have access to every piece of media on the internet. And um, for most people that meant downloading, I was part of a much smaller community of people who were actually uploading the stuff that everyone else was downloading. And through that, I became really fascinated with the way that media propagates on the internet. Um, and you know, th so, so that evolved from sort of FTP servers, then BitTorrent was invented and, and it sort of democratized access to the files that were on those servers. Um, and ultimately bandwidth and storage got very cheap. And, and then you start to see like file lockers, like mega upload and rapid share, um, which allowed anyone to host a file through the browser and anyone to download it th through the browser as well. And, and with that came sort of a, what I call curation renaissance of you know, great music blogs and film blogs because suddenly anyone could um, curate and distribute in, in one go. But something that was missing from all of that um, was the, the sort of means for the participants in these file sharing communities to sort of coordinate with and communicate with one another. Um, and, and that was because none of these protocols had identity sort of baked in um, to the file sharing network, right? Um, they were all just files for, or protocols for moving the, yeah. the bits. And so mm -hmm. around the same time, you had um, the rise of social media. And, and I think there's an interesting contrast in that social media in abstract really did one thing that was very important, which is it bundled the means to distribute a file, you know, like a status update or a photo with identity so that people could you know, talk to one another and talk about the file. Yes. And obviously that was a very good idea huh. and, and sort of led to YouTube and Facebook success. And, and, um, and now of course those platforms sort of have come to dominate the way um, creators of media on the internet sort of reach their fans and monetize and so on. Um, the reason I tell that story is, is that's what sort of set me on a path um, that was not traditionally you know, venture or tech related at all. I actually got into, um, right music, but just by virtue of being a huge fan <clears throat> from downloading lots of stuff. And, um, you know, I started out throwing parties and concerts and eventually started an artist management company with the goal of um, helping the artists use these new technology platforms to reach their fans directly and monetize without depending on the traditional major label system. So the idea was to help them wow. capture more of the value they create from yeah. the media that they themselves distribute online. And I guess through that work, I became very familiar with the ways in which the these new platforms, social media platforms, were intermediating that relationship. Now, yeah. this is a long-winded way to how I got to crypto. So in, in 2013, I learned about Bitcoin. And what struck me about the protocol um, was not so much the sort of financial aspects of it, which of course are interesting, but what, what interested me more was the, the, the sort of fact that here's a peer-to-peer -peer network that in many ways is kind of similar to BitTorrent. But it has something that BitTorrent lacked. It has identity and attribution baked into the network and that each transaction in the network, each piece of data is, is signed with a cryptographic key and can be attributed 
to the to the person who put it there. And um, and so my my immediate thought was, wow, what if you could do the same um, for a different kind of digital asset instead of a financial asset? What about a digital media asset? Well, if you could attribute the the data to who put it there, well, that would empower creators of that that media to capture more of the value directly. So the same idea that got me into the management artist management business is what got me to start a startup, which I co-founded in 2014 called Media Chain Labs, right. um, where we set out to build what we call the Universal Media Library. And we were yeah. fairly naive at the time. We didn't really appreciate how difficult of a technical challenge that would be. Um, and, and we initially set out to build it on top of Bitcoin. And of course, that wasn't possible. So we ended up having to go down the yeah. stack and build out a lot of stuff ourselves. And I think our weave has done the bulk, the lion's share of the work um, to realize the vision that, that we sort of um, set out to achieve back then. And we were just a bit too early. Um, we ended up having sort of a good outcome though, and that that was the era of enterprise blockchains, right? Blockchain, not Bitcoin. There was, there was a lot of like Fortune 500 yeah. interest in the space. Spotify ended up acquiring the company and um, I led blockchain R&D there briefly. Um, and uh -huh. before, uh, getting recruited by one of our investors, which was Andreessen Horowitz, uh, to join their crypto team. And so, um, yeah, I spent, prior to launching Variant, spent roughly three years on the investment team um, with A16Z, ran the crypto startup school program there, and then decided yeah. to spin out Variant on my own to focus on um, what I call the ownership economy, which I'll get into, um, but but also to focus on backing projects at the earliest possible stages where whereas A6 and Z is a much bigger fund and tends to focus a little bit later stage. Figures. Wow. I had no idea you came from the Wares scene. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I had quite a few friends that were involved with that back in the day. Um, nice. That's it's actually how I met my co-founder at Media Chain as well, uh, Dennis. He, yeah, I know. We were both involved in that and we didn't know each other, but mm -hmm. we later bonded over our sort of shared experience there. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I had something... Uh, but I'm not sure I should say it on camera, but anyway, yeah, I heard something about that. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, yeah, and what, what you're saying about that, that, uh, that authorship piece in relation to, to these protocols is, is really interesting too, because I think one of the things that Arweave has taken like a, almost a deviation from, from the, the other mechanisms out there, like IPFS, for example, is that we, we, we strongly associate um, data you refer to data not by its content address, and we don't think the content addresses are actually necessarily that exciting. Like, yeah, actually, BitTorrent underneath it all had content addresses. Like, right. it had the uh, the the hash of the the chunk list was basically a content address. Um, you've had that since what, like 2003, Graham. But but anyway, uh, yeah, we we kind of iterated on that, and we we figured that at least as far as we saw it. The really important thing about a piece of information was not just the piece of information itself. It's like the piece of information, the time it was produced or the time it was committed, at least the person that committed it and then other kind of arbitrary metadata. And, and this was like a fairly abstract thought back in what 2017. Um, and the conclusion to that thought was, well, obviously there should be arbitrary metadata on this, on this information. Um, which at the time was just like, I a, a guess, why not throw in some tags? You know, we can limit it to two kilobytes and then like we can index it if we want to. Or it's just like baked into the protocol. It's such an interesting thing people can play with. And now like all this time later, it's those arbitrary tags that are enabling all of these profit sharing community applications people are building. Because you just like index on the tags with GraphQL. Turns out like three years later, that's what you do with them. Um, but that wasn't clear to us at the time. So yeah, I think that's really interesting that like the evolution of these protocols so you kind of point out is from just like addressing and moving the information around to then having the metadata about the information well expressed as well. Yeah, it's like who who made the thing? What is it about? You know, yeah. how, and and then with that yeah. rich metadata, you can build all kinds of you know interesting applications that surface that information yeah. in, in in new ways. Um, yeah. So so yeah, I, I I love that vision, and I think you know what we imagined it leading to. Um, was sort of a, a, a media library on top of which anyone could build the next Spotify, the next SoundCloud, the next Instagram, um, but all in a way 
that one, you know, rewards the creators of the media because their attribution is sort of baked in. And two, um, you know, allows for much more interesting experiments in how we consume media, because today, of course, only yeah. Spotify can innovate on their library of content. Um, but if you had all this stuff open and right. all the metadata available, any developer could sort of, you know, remix the end user experience and, and come up with sort of niche or, or, you know, novel ways of experiencing the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. Have you seen what Vand Play and ArcLight are doing in the Aweave ecosystem? I haven't. No, but I'd be, it sounds like I would be excited to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like it, I was thinking when you were talking about um, essentially like recording label you you were working on. They're basically working on that kind of vision that says, okay, so you can upload your tracks, and then there's a profit sharing token which is associated with the album, and then it has a similar kind of model to. I think they both basically have a similar model to Bandcamp. Uh, where you know people can tip and then they can download um, the albums like the zip and like high quality uh, copies of everything. Um, but it's really just a tip. But as the as the artist, you can monetize that profit stream by selling parts of the profit sharing token uh, that essentially direct the tips over time. And so you can right. monetize it early and then use that to basically do like almost a VC model. So you, you well, that's similar to a record label price, too, right? It's it. It, it's yeah. like an, it's almost like an, you're getting an advance, but instead of getting it from yes. a label, you're getting it from yeah. your fans, and that's great because now your fans not only are able to support you, and, and it's sort of you know uh, that's patronage, but they're also exposed to the yeah. financial upside of your success. So you're sort of marrying patronage and profit, which I think is a fantastic sort of area to explore. Yeah, yeah, I think um, Ivan from. I think I saw Ivan in the attendee list, at least on Emmy. Uh, he, he's the founder of um, uh, yeah, one of these projects, Bandplay. You might want to speak to him afterwards, potentially. Um, but, but your point also brings up the kind of a larger thing and something that uh, Fabian, who may also be here, actually, um, is working on with our Verify. Because like one of the strange things about the Perman web is everything is associated with an identity. Every single thing that everyone says on every platform is associated with an identity strongly, which has a history that you can look through. And, and Fabian's iterating on this and saying, okay, so it's kind of cool that like, when I see someone post something on Feedweave, I can just be like, hey, I wonder what else this person has posted elsewhere in the firmware web. And then, you know, critical obvious question, are they a bot, right? Is this a real right. human? What's the likelihood this is a civil uh, attack, essentially? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and Fabian's building this system that essentially allows you to do verification of those identities across the perma web. So it's almost like the blue tick right. for the perma web. It's pretty cool. I love that. Also, an another sort of like metaphor for explaining why this is so cool is yeah. that, you know, hyperlinks, I, I feel like are, are sort of two dimensional. It's like you go from uh -huh. A to B, you can, it, yeah. it's sort of you move laterally um, yep. across like one plane. But the perma web and the fact that everything is attributed in provenance, it adds a third dimension. There's sort of becomes a Z axis where uh -huh. you know each file each, each piece of media you're not just moving from one to the next you can actually move back and forth you can you can sort time, of like track the yes they're chrono links chrono hyperlinks i sometimes call them <laughs> yeah I, I don't think people have played with this too much but definitely that is a really interesting thing about the perma web you can jump backwards in time and then forwards um yeah, yeah i think that's going to be really interesting to play with over time and, yeah. and you can do that with all of these Perma Web apps because like when people deploy a new UI for their app, if they're a profit sharing community or otherwise, you can always just go back and use a previous UI. Like if you right. don't think the application is moving in a good direction, you just don't update essentially. Right. Which, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, a, it, imagine, imagine just like every image you saw on Instagram, uh -huh. you could like tap three times and get the Z access for that image's history across the perma web. Yeah. Like each interaction that every application had with it, you could, you could wow. you know, sort of peruse all of that metadata. Yeah. And, and that's like the rich context that's sort of missing from the web today that, that becomes yeah. possible when everyone's, you know, building on top of the universal library of, of, of content. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things we've been thinking about a lot, in the ecosystem is like two basic um, standards we want to create. They're like so small, they can hardly be called standards, but I think they'd be valuable. One is like relates. So uh, an arbitrary tag that you can mm -hmm. add to any transaction that just says relates previous transaction. And yep. then also succeeds or supersedes um, transaction, because then you can essentially create forked knowledge of any kind. You can say, 
well, this piece of uh, knowledge is just like this other thing that I've produced or someone else produced, um, except I've modified it slightly. And then you can create a kind of, um, yeah, it, it, almost a GitHub of knowledge. The right. chain becomes one by default. Yeah, super. Yeah, so so all of this stuff I think was very much a part of the vision for Media Chain, and I think is now being huh. realized in our weave, which is wow. amazing. Um, and and one one sort of adjacent thing to just bring into the mix here, um, bit of a tangent, but I see a similar sort of um, mix of ideas emerging in NFT space, right? So digital art, um, essentially, mm -hmm. you know, an NFT is just a canonical identifier with metadata yeah. hooked to it. Um, and, and so, you know, I see these two worlds intersecting at some yeah. point. I think they're, they're going towards the same ends, which is again, you know, the way I think of it is sort of this universal media library. It's just different <laughs> means to the same, to the same end. But, I, but I think that they will intersect and that may be an opportunity for folks in, in the r -Weave community. Oh yeah. Like people are already, um, I mean, it's, it's not like the, the r -Weave community adoption wise is kind of splitting in two almost there's the people that are building like profit sharing communities which you might call like are we native stuff mm -hmm. and then there's also are we just making its way as the back end into a whole bunch of other applications and one of those is like nfts we see yeah. a lot of uptick because people are like oh obviously i want the data that, that backs my nft to be permanent why, why wouldn't i yeah. um yeah, and so we and, see and a lot I think, of. I think okay. it may be that rather than are we just being the back end for that sort of thing it ends up becoming are we native, as you say, right? Like it because uh, because the architecture yeah. is just better for it. Yes, something very interesting. I, I'll chat to you later about one of these things. But there's someone coming to our demo day that's working on a kind of NFT project that uh, yeah goes in exact, exactly this direction. I actually think you know them personally, but anyway, we'll get to it after. Cool. Okay, that that's super interesting. Yeah, there's there's so many areas of crossover in the things we've been thinking about here. I I think that the, one of the things that that I'm personally curious about in the like road to adoption on a lot of this stuff is how ownership relates to access and control. Because in the in the profit sharing tokens that we see embedded, like the royalty stream tokens, you could call them. So in Banfay or Arclight, um, yeah, you're essentially buying parts of the royalties that are just tips though. And they're, they're tips, they're like voluntary donation. You know, anyone could go and they could find if they wanted to the the media in the background and then download it. And they have a mm -hmm. copy and no one's paid. Mm -hmm. um, but in reality, like 80, 90% of people don't do that. Right. And we can put in basic like piracy protection into these applications to stop people doing that. But like, well, or at least to try and stop people doing it. But the reality is that it, it comes back to like the mantra, information wants to be free, right? You really get the impression with these protocols for moving information around or handling information on the internet in general that information does just want to be free. And, and it's interesting how we try and constrain it or link it to ownership of assets. Um, and it certainly works fine for tips, but one of my big questions about the NFT industry is like, okay, so you're, you're contributing your new Van Gogh painting to the art world, or you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> a, a real masterpiece to, to the art weave. And then you're saying ownership is dictated by this smart contract. Okay. so. In the real world, if I own um, these headphones, right? If I own these headphones, I have some control over them. I can uh, do things with them. I can use them, and other people can't do that. Um, so, I, so you call that like access rights, as well as um, you know, I can sell them, reselling rights. So you have reselling rights, but you don't have access rights, and you don't have any control. Like I can choose to mod them to have like a hardwired uh, cable or whatever it is. In the NFT space, it doesn't really seem that you have that. And particularly with like, in some sense, Arweave is attempting to become the open permanent library of all valuable knowledge and information, um, which is kind of where the internet was going in some senses anyway. But you feel like it's almost at odds with the NFT space, which is saying ownership should be represented in tokens sometime, in some form. And the question is like, what is ownership if not control and access rights? So, okay, so yeah, I think that's a common criticism, right, is of NFTs is you can co simply copy paste the JPEG, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so why would you assign any value to the token that is associated with that JPEG? Um, my view on it is, is as follows, that um, the more 
the num the the more a JPEG is copy pasted and and you know flies around the internet, the more viral it goes. Mm -hmm. The more va social value it accrues, yes. right? And uh -huh. um, and 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 so the reason that you might want to own an NFT associated with that mm -hmm. idea yeah. is what what you point out. It's you own the canonical instance of that thing, and right. I would imagine over time. Um, there will be developers and applications that sort of conform to the NFT standard as a compliant way of reusing the work. Yeah. Right. So, so, so it's kind of similar to the, I, I think it's pretty similar to the PSC model where, like you said, you could in theory, you know, access all the files on the perma web without paying anything for them, right? Like they are infinitely consumable. Yeah. Um, but there are folks who opt in to the sort of compliant approach, which is in, in the PSC yep. world tipping and in the NFT world, maybe it's, you know, fee for, for a certain type of usage and all of yep. that can happen very programmatically and sort of behind the scenes. Um, and that's what ultimately drives the sort of long-term fundamental value of both PSC tokens and NFT tokens. But, but I think in the short term, um, what's interesting about NFTs is there's, there's sort of this just, you know, speculative collector game being played yeah. out in the meanwhile, right? So ahead of the fundamental exploitation rights that that have yeah. a revenue stream attached to them, you do have collectors just, you know, showing off, hey, I own this canonical rare Pepe or, you know, whatever viral meme. <laughs> yeah. Your... Interesting. Yeah, I mean, so there's definitely, it is definitely true that there are, you almost own the social rights associated with the asset. Right. Um, and, and I think I think that has more value than people realize, because yeah, you know, I Chris, so. Chris Dixon has this famous quote that, you know, the next big thing always starts out looking like a toy. I think he, that's not actually his quote, but he popularized it in the tech world. And, you know, I, I think of NFTs very much fitting that model where it's like it's this yeah. stupid little it's a stupid toy. Why would you want to own the thing that uh, that went viral? Even the, yeah. if you can copy paste it. But again, it's it's a social sort of, you know, show off rights in the short term, but that I think becomes long-term export exploitation rights when you start to have developers building compliance services that consume those digital media assets. Yeah, I think you're definitely right. That's super interesting. I, I think that it's actually kind of great. Like it, it reminds me interestingly of the changes that, that happened in the music industry, which you might know something about, mm -hmm. in, the, in the early days of, as a response to the early days of piracy. It seems like we're almost moving towards a world where information wants to be free and largely is free, and then people voluntarily comply with right. access limitations right. and, or, or uh, yeah, right. exactly right. It's it's you know Spotify won because of the convenience mm -hmm. um, that yeah. it offered consumers and and rights holders and so on, and then um, and and I think that the same thing will happen um, for NFTs for profit sharing communities. Yeah. It's it's sort of the defaults are important. And if you're able to, you know, you know, build a platform that's fundamentally easier to consume, developers will build on it, right? Yeah. Um, so, so, so that's why I'm optimistic about there being long-term fundamental value to all of this. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's obvious I, to me that the, the definitely is. It's just a case of what value that form takes and and how how to program. One thing I'm interested in is like how do we programmatically uh, value something like an NFT, like Mm -hmm. As as you describe it, one mechanism as well the 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 uh, the more the rare Pepe spreads, then arguably the more the social rights associated with the asset should be. That's definitely one way of doing it. And it should be possible to make some kind of algorithm which shows us that. But that's like a side curiosity of mine. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that actually that this world where the information is free and then access rights are, are kind of uh, almost voluntary, but at least like they are encouraged and implied but in reality they can't really be enforced completely is is quite good it, it keeps it, it keeps the power balance kind of reasonable so fewer people are being exploited like it, one of the things spotify had to do is it, it did have to compete with BitTorrent, and right. and it seems like we found the happy medium it was like okay it turns out ten dollars a month is what everyone is willing to pay um to to uh, have this better experience which is in competition essentially with BitTorrent. Right. Yeah. Um, 
And and it's funny, like a, a little known fact about Spotify is, is it actually used BitTorrent under the hood in the early wow. days um, because it was actually the best tool for the job of yes. delivering the experience it's of instant playback yeah. on every song ever. Like technically at that time, you know, cloud infrastructure wasn't as mature as it is now. So they used BitTorrent to scale in, you know, delivery of the files. It was a private instance of the network, of course, but, um, but, but it's just interesting how, you know, there's the technology disruption which was BitTorrent, which enabled this new way of consuming, you know, sort of instant yeah. playback and streaming. And then Spotify layered this, you know, convenience of discovery and, and you know, um, and all the stuff in one place. Mm-hmm. And that's what w- let them win, right? So, um, yeah. so, so I think that just goes to show that while you can go out of your way to do it in a non-compliant way, um, if you're able to build a better experience because of, um, you know, the, the being compliant, um, yeah. y- you have a much better shot of winning a much larger market opportunity. Right. I mean, like people wanted to be compliant more than non-compliant at a base level, but they also didn't want to essentially pay exploitative fees. And so it was a question of like, at what level should the fees be set? And that's kind of the game that played out. It's right. very interesting. I think has, yeah, it, for our communities on top of the are we ecosystem, I think that's going to be an instructive example over time. But this has been an enormous digression. <laughs> Very interesting, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but a yeah. long way from the, the point we were originally talking about. So maybe you can take us through like your thoughts on the ownership economy, uh, your thesis for it, how it relates to profit sharing communities, if you could perhaps, and then we'll go from there. Okay, sure. So yeah, so I think um, like pulling back, we, we should we should look at um, you know why developers might want to build on top of a open library of content, you know, whether that would have, you know, the, the universal library as we both sort yeah. of refer to it as, right. And, and I think the, the key reason is platform risk. So, you know, mm-hmm. in the history of web two, most platforms have followed this very predictable um, curve where they, they start out, you know, um, trying to attract as many users as possible, and yep. um, and they do that by you know inviting developers to build on their APIs, inviting publishers to you know publish and promote their content, and then over time, as as the network effects grow and they sort of lock each of these participants in, they move from cooperating to competing with each yep. of these stakeholders in the network. And so this is a yep. sort of an S curve where you start out you know cooperating to grow, then you hit the top of the S yep. curve and it plateaus. And, and then they shut off the APIs, they squeeze all the juice out of the publishers and everyone feels like they got burned. And of course, the reason they're doing this is um, to extract profits for shareholders. So, yeah, yeah. Start, I, I'm, just, I'm just amazed. I'm, I'm amazed because I, I, I had a slide in, in a deck that, like, well, I, I try and use a new deck every time I talk, but like a slide that I frequently used in decks uh, for like a year and a half that had precisely that curve. Although my curve at the end, it, it, I was making the assertion that the, the quality dropped off as well. It wasn't just that it leveled out. The quality of the well, use of the application actually declined. Right. Um, well, well, so that's the growth. I would say quality, my, the, the curve I was referring to is actually a growth curve, right? So you cooperate oh, okay. and, and then you yeah. grow and then you, you, uh-huh. you hit some ceiling in growth. Yeah. Um, and you start to compete and extract value. And I think once you start to hit that extractive phase, mm-hmm. the quality declines yeah. because you're, you're, right. you're, you're making the service worse by say putting more ads or, or yeah. shutting off third party, de- you know, applications that people were using. And so developers and users have been burned by this sort of model. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the question I'm interested in is, is there a way to avoid that inevitable extractive phase of network growth. And I think yeah. the answer um, lies in what I call the ownership economy, wherein you have networks um, that are not owned by third party shareholders. Instead, they're networks that are built, operated and owned by their users. And if the users own the network, they don't need to extract profits for shareholders. Instead, they can just maximize the benefit of the service to them. And yeah. so, um, you know, I, I look at what's happening in crypto to date, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and Arweave and, and, and the like, these layer one blockchains, I think are the first examples of networks that conform to this new model where the users, you know, build, operate and own the network. And as a result, there is no platform risk for developers who want to build on top. They don't have to worry that the underlying platform 
is going to change the rules against their will and sort of shut off the innovation that's possible, um, like happen, you know, like what happened in, in most Web2 platforms. Um, and so the, if it follows that if you can eliminate this platform risk um, through sort of user ownership, you can build networks that are bigger and grow faster because of better economic alignment between the users and the platform itself. Hmm. Because they never yeah. hit this sort of extractive phase of the S curve. Um, yeah. And so, so that's the guiding sort of principle of my thesis for variant fund. And, and in short, my view is that um, the layer one blockchains, which are sort of the first multi, you know, multi-million, multi-billion dollar networks to, to realize this organizational model at scale. Um, that same model is going to, you know, quote unquote, cross the chasm from um, developer facing infrastructure to mm -hmm. consumer facing platforms. And I think that, you know, transition is underway right now. And so the opportunity, I think, um, I mentioned earlier, Spotify used BitTorrent under the hood, right? So yeah. Um, Another little known fact is that the founder of Spotify, Daniel Ek, was actually the CEO of MuTorrent before Spotify. <laughs> so, so I did he, not know that. <laughs> so he, Daniel Ek understood the, the power of the technology innovation of BitTorrent and then decided, hey, I'm going to take the, the sort of latent demand that's now possible or to, you know, that can now be expressed because of the technology innovation. I'm going to make it into a consumer product. I, I think of like crypto tokens as a similar sort of technology innovation, like in, in the analogy, they would be like BitTorrent. So we have this new way of doing things, which is crypto tokens. We can move value to pe you know, people who generate it anywhere on the internet. And the opportunity yeah. now is for sort of this generation's Daniel Ek to come along and say, hey, that model that Bitcoin, Arweave, Ethereum, and others sort of pioneered, um, yeah. we can now productize that and make it a keystone of consumer product experiences. Mm -hmm. Wow, um, that's... That's fascinating. That's so, uh, uh, yeah, like you, as far as I see it, what you're essentially describing on the developer side is what USV and you think Danny Grant and maybe Nick from USV um, described as like developer integrity. Well, one mm -hmm. of the ideas that, again, back in another one of those slides I used to use all the time, um, we, we modified that idea and we were like, yeah, okay, you can take the same ideas of developer integrity. Basically, the API is not going to shift under your feet. You can be confident that you're not going to become um, beholden to this new company uh, if you start using their, their system because instead you're, you're the client of a network. Um, mm -hmm. You can take that to, to consumers as well. We call it consumer integrity, this whole idea that uh, if you have any kind of web app and it's running in a truly decentralized way today, you will always come back or be able to come back to it in its current form. And so now the relationship that you have with the founder or the developer of that application is very different. They can't change it in the future to make it worse. Otherwise, you just won't update to the new version. It's actually almost like the, the forking behavior that you get in a blockchain network. So it's expressed inside consumer applications. Right. Okay. Yeah. And there's also, I think there's, there, there's that piece of it, which is, is, is very powerful. And the other piece that I think is, um, is really interesting novel is the economic piece, right? So the ability to align um, a user's economic interests with the success of the product or service that they're using every day. That's, yeah. I think, a really, that's, yes. that's sort of a really, really powerful new tool in the toolkit for bootstrapping adoption and, and the, the growth of network effects. Because um, essentially, yeah. users now have a choice. Do you want to use a platform that extracts value from you or a platform mm -hmm. that rewards you meritocratically for the value that you yeah. contribute? Um, and, and so wow. my view is once one platform does this in, in the sort of consumer space at scale, it's going to be a, a zero to one moment where if you're not doing this, you're no longer competing on the same terms as those who are. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and that's when, you know, I think there's going to be sort of a rush of entrepreneurs, you know, leaning into this new model that I call the ownership economy model. Wow. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's. So many of the conversations we've been having in the Arweave community recently. I mean, th this whole idea that um, you can you can actually reward early contributors with ownership of the thing itself is mm -hmm. is is kind of an evolution of obviously what's been happening in crypto for a while. But now you can take it down to like the applications and the platforms you're using that you might use on a day to day basis rather than like 
actually quite complex and maybe even foreign sometimes feeling um, decentralized finance stuff. And we've also been looking at, you know, what happens in the DeFi space. There's, there's a lot of, some positives, a lot of negatives to that, how that, how that whole um, episode went down. But one of the really interesting things that we saw was like, okay, if you reward people in governance rights, as well as potentially profit rights, and we think they're stronger in the Arweave community, I think. But um, yeah, if you reward people with these rights when they use the application first, that can be an overwhelmingly powerful tool for bringing in the first users of an, a network or a protocol or whatever it happens to be. And so I think what we might see over time is profit sharing communities are now essentially using this model of uh, giving tokens, giving PSTs to the early users. I think we could see that become like a secret weapon in getting these things adopted, which just uh, no Web2 company can compete with the idea that instead of you setting up, you know, a recurring payment to Dropbox or whatever it is um, that's going to drain your bank account over time. And the more you use it, obviously, you don't want to delete your data. So you're basically locked into paying them forever. Um, instead of that happening, you're going to pay once and then you're going to be rewarded in ownership of the platform that you've used. Yep. Which actually has real value and real uh, governance rights associated with it. This is our drive. Um, yeah. And, and, and the governance rights. So, yeah. so you have the economic alignment. And that's a strong incentive to join in the governance rights, ensure that the platform remains aligned with you over time because yeah. you actually have a say in what happens. And that's very, very different yeah. than the Web2 world. And, and yeah. one, so one thing I always like to point out here is that um, what you're describing in terms of ownership as, you know, as an incentive um, is not a new concept to folks in Silicon Valley. In fact, it's very familiar, you know, all, you know, one one of the best discoveries of Silicon Valley was the fact that if you give employees stock options, yes, you can recruit the best yeah. talent to join you in the you know yeah. the crusade to build a a very powerful um, and valuable company, and yeah. and so that the idea of ownership as a tool to build networks is not new. Yep. What's new is who can participate in that. So instead of being constrained to employees that you know can work at your company legally or you know. We're having to set up different, you know, entities in different jurisdictions to enable that. We now have this new tool, which are crypto tokens, which you allow you to move that kind of ownership value in the same way you move information. So, so as a result, yeah. you open up the talent pool to anyone who can receive information on the internet, and and that's <laughs> very yeah. powerful. I think because it means that the distinction between employees and users can be completely broken down. Um, yeah. And now your users who spread the word, you know, your user, your users who spread the word uh, about your project, for example, they effectively work in your marketing department, right? And yes. and so they should be compensated as such. Um, yeah. And if I think zooming out, if you look at the history of like software in the internet age, it's a very sort of linear progression to arrive at this point, in my view, because mm -hmm. you, you know I think the biggest surprise of um, of, of software in the internet era is the success of open source software and how, you know, software that's essentially crowdsourced from independent developers all over the world um, has gone on to power trillions of value built on, on top. Oh, sorry. And so I'll do that for five seconds. If you could just rewind, please. Sure. I was, I was just saying how it's, it's kind of remarkable how, you know, open source software, which is software that is crowdsourced from developers all over the world, mm -hmm. Um, now powers trillions of dollars of economic value in that it's like in every device in, in all of our pockets, it's, it's, yeah. it underlies many of the, the, the biggest platforms um, that people in, interact with every day. And in turn, those platforms that use this crowdsource software um, also crowdsource a lot of their value from their users. They crowdsource products and marketplaces or content and social media networks. And, and yeah. so the whole like internet model is all about crowdsourcing stuff, whether code or, or products or, or, um, or content. And now what we're, what we're able to do because we can distribute value back to users um, at a cost of you know, moving information is we can actually crowdsource the operations of the platform itself from the users. So we crowdsource the code, yes. the content, and now the operations. <laughs> Yep. And, and so yeah. the result is networks that are owned and operated by users. Um, and I see it as a very linear sort of progression. That's fascinating. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, this is to like the one of the core parts of the vision 
for uh, profit sharing communities, at least when we like first proposed them, um, which really came out of like a few different discussions we had with different community members and realized that profit sharing tokens could actually just be expanded by this one simple idea, which is that what if everyone that owns a profit sharing token can vote to issue more profit sharing tokens to other people that have contributed to adding value essentially to the application that they're all backing. And then you can kind of take this whole VC model where the, the basic idea is founder goes out, raises money, uses the fiat money. So sells equity, gets money, dollars, uses the dollars to pay people to make the equity more valuable. Like, what if you could flip that a little bit? What if you could say instead, okay, well, we are a community. We will vote to issue more tokens to people relative to the value that they've added to the community. And then people can take those tokens that they've been given and monetize however much or little they want. And, and I totally think you're right. Um, this, this discovery that basically you give people stock and they're more excited about where the project is or company is going is, is profound. And also in some senses is kind of obvious. Like it, we should have known that was the case, but to see it in practice is a whole different thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but I do think that the one thing that the Silicon Valley model has, uh, maybe, it hasn't embraced this as fully as I think it's possible that we could. I think that actually, you know, equity stock option plan, the reality is if you're like the fifth employee, you're not actually going to end up with the ability to even buy that much equity in, in the company that you're working at, um, which, which limits the, the power of the incentives. Whereas with these networks, I think we can go a whole lot further. We can say, well, what if you just took, you know, the, the, what I would call like a pure profit sharing community would be saying, what if you just took all of your pay in profit sharing tokens, and then you can choose how much you want to monetize and how much you want to keep um, in the tokens that, that represent ownership in, in the community. And then you can also take part in governance rights proportionately to that, uh, yeah, to that ownership. Yeah. And, and so this, sorry, go on. Well, well, yeah, I think it's, I think fundamentally the difference is, you know, Silicon Valley stock option plans are like, you know, thick packets of legal documents and yeah. what you're describing is code. And so you yeah. can, you know, express any kind of sort of ownership mechanism design, or you can design for any kind of ownership mechanism that you want. And so there's going to be a lot more experimentation. And I think, yeah, we will push the boundaries of, of how to design optimal incentive systems because we don't need the lawyers to figure <laughs> it out. Yeah. And, and so when we, when we first started talking about this, uh, Cedric, who's a long-time community member, but also an RWF developer advocate, but nowadays really just the founder of Community XYZ, this, this platform he built. He was like, this is amazing. Let's, let's go build this thing. And it has this job board. And we were expecting the jobs would be like, hey, please, can you make sure that there's a comment box on my blog post platform, something like this. And then you get 0.1% of the, the PSTs in that platform or whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. um, but, but very, very rapidly, people started to use it for other things like, hey, help me QA test, you know, integrate this into your application. And then suddenly it, it became this kind of um, this hub where people are offering ownership for any kind of value creation for the project and the application that the, they're collectively building, which yeah. is precisely really, I think, what you're saying. Like we're muddying the lines more and more between who is employed. I mean, the profit sharing community has zero employees fundamentally, doesn't employ anyone. Um, yeah. And then who's a consumer or who's a user. And, mm -hmm. and I think those, those barriers are just completely, they're breaking down. And I think what they will eventually be wiped away entirely. Totally. I, and, and, and of course this has like been a long time coming, right? Because, you know, yeah. Instagram users effectively are the entire value of the product. They, they do, yeah. you know, create the value of the company. Yes. They don't work at the company, but they should be probably rewarded for the value that they create. And so exactly. that, that's the future I'm, you know, I'm, I'm investing in. I think like maybe, maybe a good segue here, we, we could talk a bit about um, sort of how the, the, the life cycle of um, projects and, and you know, profit sharing communities building in this model uh, differs from that of a traditional startup. And, and in particular, talk about like, fundraising, um, given yeah. you know, I'm a manager. And, and so, um, so, so, so you, you mentioned this earlier that, um, traditional startups, they go and they raise, so, you know, a, a seed round and then a round and then subsequent rounds of capital. And, um, each round of financing that a, a startup takes on, um, ends up diluting the early founders, the early investors. 
Um, and generally, like those early founders and investors are, are happy to take that dilution because um, the idea is that this new capital coming into the company is going to be spent uh-huh. on growth and, and that's going to grow the pie for everyone. So while on a exactly. percentage basis, yeah. you own less, um, but you end you up own more value. You own more, right. You own more value. Um, what's, what's a little bit different in, you know, crypto world or, you know, profit sharing community world or DAO world is that um, the, the sort of explicit goal of any project is to quote unquote exit to the community of users and make the users the owners. And, yeah. and so that implies that instead of raising financial capital from investors, you can raise both financial and production capital, the form of mm-hmm. labor or work f- yes. directly from your users. Yeah. Um, and, and so if that's true and that's the goal, um, I think it follows that um, these kinds of startups will not raise subsequent rounds of financing from VCs. They will not raise, you know, series A, B, C, D, E, F, G from, from, from right. venture capital, they'll raise it from their users, which is, I think, a yeah. better way to ensure that the platform, uh, you know, remains aligned with those users over time. That said, um, it's still the case for a lot of projects that you need to build something that people want, first want, right, in order to attract mm-hmm. the users. Um, mm-hmm that are going to come and, and step into operating the thing. And, and so um, there, there's often this gap that needs to be filled at the outset of a project wherein, you know, the, 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 the founder uh, who has the idea goes heads down and builds for six months a year, whatever, however long it takes to get to that stage where they have a product and they can iteratively get to product market fit. Um, mm-hmm. And my view is, is, um, that you know, that's the place for VCs, and, and it's to help founders get to that stage where they found product market fit, and they can start to turn ownership over the product that they have built to the users who actually engage with it. Um, and and what I think we saw in 2017, which is sort of the anti pattern that you want to avoid, is founders doing it in the opposite order, which is starting yes. with a token that they sell to prospective users before they built the product. Mm-hmm. And then having to effectively make product decisions by committee with the token holders or the community who just want the number to go up and don't have any like real um, familiarity with the, the, the founder's vision because the product isn't visible to them. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's like the lesson learned from 2017 and, and the inverse where you build a product first and then exit to the community is, is far better um, or increases the chances of, of being able to find product market fit. And so there's still potentially a role for um, VC investment at the earliest possible stages, but the life cycle of these kinds of projects is very different from traditional startups. Yeah, that's super interesting. It, it just reminds me like one of the kind of patterns, you know, we're trying to work out like what is the founder journey for a, a profit sharing community uh, mm-hmm. developer. and the kind of pattern that appears to be developing in the ecosystem is something along the lines of uh, the founder comes along, they, they build the basic version of the application, the MVP. And because these are basically all web applications, this is like a whole different game than building a crypto network. You know, like building a crypto network is a lot of work. Actually building an MVP of a web app is like sometimes a weekend. You know, you can build really useful, interesting profit sharing community applications on our even a weekend or less. Um, so, so it has different dynamics in that sense. You can get to that MVP stage uh, and then you start giving away some usage rewards, right? So for example, our driver running a campaign right now, if you go and you use our drive, um, they, and uh, thankfully Tate and the team at Verto have built this thing they call Astatine, which I still can't pronounce correctly. Um, but it's basically <laughs> this mechanism that allows you to uh, emulate the mining algorithms. So the, the, work or reward divided by work proportion um yeah reward proportioning proportioning um systems that you would see from a crypto network for but for people using an application so Mm -hmm. phil has it set up that basically he works out how many gigabytes were stored on our drive in a day then divide the reward amount by that and then just distribute that to the users and this is really exciting for early users and um i think particularly who was it that, that came up with this idea of the different waves of adoption that you get for a new technology. But like the first wave of that is, oh, sorry. Well, yeah, I think Dixon, Chris Dixon at A16Z is, is great at, the, uh, at sort of identifying this. There's developer market fit, right? Where it's first like, you know, the low level infrastructure and developers figuring out the platform and, and so on. And then 
the second phase is generally you know traditional product market fit between consumers and the application developers yeah and the, like the, one of the the first ways you get is like these early adopters and what early adopter in the world doesn't want to own a piece of the the technology they're adopting and so yeah we're starting to see the ecosystem pick up this this pattern where they say okay well i'll just give out you know some small percentage of the rewards at the beginning and then programs over time in increasing size um yeah so that people can claim a part of ownership of the the profit sharing community but at the same time they can take that to you know verto and they can those people that have it can sell it if they want but at the same time that the founders would only really take part in private sales that are happening uh, unadvertised to accredited only investors which given the regulatory situation we find ourselves in right now it's, it's probably like a safer route it appears at least um yeah and so that kind of plays into what you're talking about so then the early people that you're uh, getting backed by a, a basically just angel investors and um, smaller funds uh, that are providing the capital that gets you through to kind of product market fit. And then from there, it's, you know, yeah, it's even more community based. Exactly. And and that's exactly why I started Variant, which is a much smaller fund, um, Yeah, you know, with such a size for the opportunity of focusing at this stage as a dedicated focus, because I think that's, you know, that is the opportunity for projects building in this space. Yeah, for sure. Wow, such an unbelievable fit between our ideas here. Anyway, um, so I guess uh, now would be a great time if anyone from the chat, I see some, uh, yeah, I see some interesting comments, but I'm not sure I see any uh, questions. If you do have any questions, please just drop them in the chat. Otherwise, uh, Jesse, is there anything else, like any final ideas you wanna go through? I suppose like, you know, um, any advice for people fundraising? Because obviously there's, it's about, so there's 25, 26, 27 profit sharing communities on the Arweave network right now. Um, mm -hmm. And I would say like a good 10 of those, maybe 12, uh, raising money. So any advice you cool. can give them would be great. Well, first piece of advice is hit me up. Um, second, <laughs> se second piece of advice is um, just, just sort of more general. I think, you know, there, of course, anyone working in crypto knows this probably, but there are a lot of investors who are sort of short term thinkers and and they look at the liquidity of, of crypto tokens and the ability to partner with teams early and say oh i can get in um, and quickly flip these tokens to unassuming buyers um, and and so the advice is just be careful about who you work with and make sure that they are um, you know coming from a front a fund that is committed for the long term the important thing to know or one important thing to know about your investor is how is their fund structured is it a hedge fund mm -hmm where the investors in the fund um, can pull their liquidity on a monthly, quarterly, annual basis. If so, that could be a reason that your investor decides to flip your token because they have to return funds to their investors. Um, or is, is the fund you're partnering with a, structured as a venture fund wherein capital is typically locked up for you know, five, 10 years? Um, yeah. So variant is, is of course the latter, and I think that's that's a question every founder should ask. And more generally, you should you should find out, you know, is this a short term or long term oriented partner? Yeah, I, I cannot agree with that enough. I uh, I lived through the 2017 2018 period, and although I was kind of as interested in crypto technically since I, well. Yeah, same almost origin as you actually. I, I was really interested in BitTorrent and then through BitTorrent I kind of found Bitcoin somewhere before dollar parity, whenever that was. Um, and then took part in mining and, and bought into the Ethereum ICO. But but basically I was just on and I only bought fifteen dollars in the Ethereum ICO because I wanted to use it for like actually as compute credits. Um yeah. I I was around but only on the technical side. And I think that might be kind of similar for some of our founders. And one of the key lessons I learned founding Arweave and, and getting involved in the more financial side of things is like, unfortunately in this space, people say great things about being long-term. Uh, there's one simple way to find out though, <laughs> just offer lockups. <laughs> that is the uh, the defining, the kind of, um, the razor that cuts the, uh, the the pack. Like, okay, so if we say take a year lockup, will, will you take it? And I would say that that's a very, very useful tool for any of the founders that want to make sure that they're getting the right kind of investors in. Um, talk is great. And, and it's really important that you make sure that you're like on the same wavelength as the investors you're working with. But the reality is the space is full of people that will uh, tell you that they're long term when they're not. So just set it in stone, make it make it official. Uh, I think that, that can be really helpful. 
Uh, <laughs> okay, so one a couple of questions here. What model do you see legally being used to give ownership uh, rights equity, but streamlining transfer of ownership? This is a very interesting question. It's kind of often coming up in the community. Yeah, so uh, there's a there's a lot of open questions here. Um, of course, like right now, I think the the guiding principle. Hang on, look, just. Of course. <laughs> So uh, yeah, I think the, the guiding principle right now that, that most projects are sort of conforming to is, is the guidance the SEC put forth about sufficient decentralization. So that's yes. of course you know um, der derived from the Howey test and in particular the efforts of others prong of Howey. So the, the yeah. SEC sort of um, commented that so long as there's not dependence on any particular entity or individuals for um, the expectation of profits. Then a, then a token is likely not a security, and and you know that that's the sort of space that most projects are testing. I do think there's potentially other models that are worth exploring, and I'm actually working right now um, uh, with with some attorneys on sort of a thought experiment here. So hmm. if, if an analogy I've, I've, I like to draw and that I've written about is the similarity between crypto networks, profit sharing communities, DAOs and co-ops and we started the conversation by talking yeah. about digital co-ops right and right. co-ops co are the sort of like you know meat space or analog form of community yeah. owned and operated networks right so what's interesting about co-ops from a regulatory perspective is that they um th there's a lot of case law that shows uh co-op membership which often is referred to as shares um mm -hmm. as as not being a security for a number of reasons mm -hmm. um and, and those reasons usually entail some kinds of restrictions on how the shares can change hands. So most cooperative shares don't have open secondary markets, like you can't buy them on the stock market. That doesn't mean that there's no liquidity. However, you can, for example, trade um, shares in a cooperative with other members of the co-op who might get more utility out of owning more shares, right? So, um, yeah. so, so the thought experiment is essentially can we use existing case law uh, pertaining to member owned organizations like co-ops and mutuals and credit unions um, to, to make the argument that many profit sharing communities and, um, you know, uh, community owned and operated networks are more like cooperatives than they are like mm -hmm. companies. And that may require to make that argument, it may require um, these projects to, you know, impose certain restrictions on themselves, like, limiting who can trade the token um, or potentially going as far as, you know, KYCing all the participants. So that's Those are the details we're working out, but I think there, there yeah. may be a path there that's um, that has the benefit of allowing for um, sort of efforts of others because mm -hmm. most traditional co-ops, mutuals, credit unions, they have a management structure and sort of governing structure that's very similar to a corporation. You have a CEO, you have a board, and there are, there are some benefits to that in that you can more effectively or quickly make decisions instead of having to do it by committee. Um, yeah. And so perhaps this path would allow uh, projects to balance sort of effective decision making or governance through leadership with user ownership in a way that's that's still compliant. That's super interesting. And to, to go back to the, the place of funds, I think in these, uh, so so that that's fascinating. We'd love to know if you could like report back to us what you, what you kind of find with that. I'm going to publish great. something on it soon, hopefully in the next oh, couple awesome. of weeks. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of people in the community that I know personally that would be interested to read that. Um, yeah, but to, to bring it back to this kind of like the place of funds within within this new structure, uh, I actually think that the one of those places could be during this period where essentially it's not clear that the thing is sufficiently decentralized. Actually, that that's a great time to get like uh, people like yourself actually um, or other people that are like really good early backers, they're kind of familiar with the space, they can offer valuable advice and then they come invested. And so they're uh, incentivized essentially to give that advice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that can help ease some of these problems with like regulatory uncertainty, frankly, because of course, you know, regardless of whether or not the thing is a security, like, well, you can sell securities, you just have to do them in the appropriate manner. And if it's a private sale and there's a whole bunch of regulation around how to do that, then that that's fine. The, the question is obviously, of course, like whether it's a public sale of some kind. Right, right. Yeah, I think, I think um, this is why I bias towards the sort of, you know, progressive approach to decentralization yeah. is that, you, you know, 
in the early days when you're not sufficiently decentralized, you, you do not have a token that could be considered a security. Instead, you yeah. go to the private markets and you build a product that people want and then you, you know, develop a user base for that product. And, and then at the point at which a token exists, um, it's distributed to the users who govern the project and, and thereby make the dependence on the efforts of others sort of a mute point because there are no efforts of others. There's only the users at that point. Yeah, exactly. Okay, amazing. Uh, utility token with rule struck rights or equity tokens with utility features, but more documentation. I was with you up until the last three words, but more documentation. Maybe you have ideas, Jesse. Utility token with rules or rights or equity tokens with utility. Oh, well, I guess, yeah, sort of contrasting, like, do you want to have a token that is explicitly a security and, mm -hmm. and just like basically lean into the regulations and say, yes, this is a security and it confers you, um, you know, utility some utility, rights, like something. you can access yeah. some premium feature or something, or do you go the other route? Um, which was is the route, the progressive decentralization route we just discussed. I have a strong bias towards the progressive decentralization route, obviously, because yeah. I think um, compliance with securities law is an extreme burden on any startup. And that's why you don't have startups go public after their series seed in, in traditional markets, because it yeah. adds so much complexity to, um, to manage for founders that really need to be focused on the product and growth and so on. And so... Um, yeah, my, my view is, you know, aim for launching a token at the point that you have product market fit and you're ready to grow the network by virtue of um, giving a token out to users and, and um, hope based on the guidance that we have that that is not a security. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have lots of thoughts about that hope, but maybe for another day. Okay, <laughs> one last question, then we'll, we'll leave it. Uh, how would you add bonding curves to a token a change of tokens in oh would how would adding bonding curves to a token change a token's interpretation in the Howie test? I'm just going to say that we're not lawyers and definitely not your lawyer. Um, that That's sounds like a very specific right. Any, question. <laughs> right. Anything I said about regulation fundraising uh, should be taken with a huge grain of salt because I'm not a lawyer and you should talk to yours. Um, yeah. <laughs> so bonding bonding curves. Um, for those not familiar, is just sort of like a, a, a mechanism. It's, it's like a vending machine for tokens. You put in one token, you get another token out. Um, and um, yeah, I think, um, so I guess to this idea we were, I was bringing about earlier that, that perhaps you could have a token that's considered more like a cooperative membership or a mutual membership. Mm -hmm. um, one interesting way to do that um, or, or, you know, to, to try to comply with, with that case law is to say, okay, this token can only trade amongst other members, not, not just anyone can trade this token. In other words, it can only be transferred from one member to another, yeah. or a member could trade it in to another member. One way to automate that is a bonding curve that's whitelisted to a certain group um, yep. of people who are deemed members. And, and there is one project that's actually done this, it's called Nexus Mutual, and it's yeah. a mutual insurance company actually incorporated in the UK whose yeah. membership is uh, reflected by a token on, on the Ethereum blockchain. And that token can only change hands um, through the bonding curve that they've built. So the vending machine wherein members mm -hmm. can say, hey, I want to you know, sort of liquidate my membership. But in order to do that, you have to go through a KYC price process and, and be added to a whitelist. Um, so bonding curves, I think, are a useful tool for automating, uh, you know, the, the, the transactions among a group of members. And, and that may be a, a valuable sort of way to, to, to make uh, the co-op or mutual model of ownership more efficient. Yeah, for sure. That, that's really interesting. It reminds me of some of the conversations that uh, we had with Tate and the rest of the Verto team in the earlier days about like, wouldn't it be cool if, so obviously profit sharing communities, one of the things they can do is vote on arbitrary attributes, essentially like JavaScript values, metadata, in fact, <laughs> that are just associated with the contract. Um, and obviously you can use that to say, hey, well, wouldn't it be nice if, if you are Verto, please use these attributes associated with our market. Or if arbitrarily, if you are an exchange of some form, please use these attributes associated with our market. Um, and that, that could be really interesting, we thought, because then you can allow the community itself to kind of guide its own liquidity in in more complex forms. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe totally. Maybe that could be used in this way. And totally. then there's questions of like, you know, you could do interesting stuff there. We've been thinking about like, what if you made it so that uh, instead of on so on receipt of a trade in Verto, uh, obviously you're normally just send back the tokens. But what if the community could vote to have a uh, send locked instead? So every time you buy tokens or something, or you trade them one way or another, you're actually trading locked or tokens that will then become locked. Oh, we've lost Jesse. <laughs> well, for everyone else watching, yes, the idea <laughs> was that you would be able to uh, trade tokens that would then become locked. And, and this um, might land them in the hands of people that are more long-term incentivized by the project. Uh, looks like Jesse is gone, but I'd just like to thank everyone that came to the session today. Um, yeah, for, for contributing. It's been a fantastic conversation. At least I was very, very <laughs> interested in the things that we had to say. Uh, can't wait to chat to you guys um, on the next session. Yeah, I think Jesse's gone. Oh, Jesse, you're back. I was I'm here. Just, I was just closing <laughs> without you. Just, I've been, I've been here the whole say, time. I don't know what happened, oh. but I heard everything. And anyway, but uh, but I agree. Thank you know, thanks for the great questions, and it was a lot of fun, uh, sort of finding all the overlap in our mutual interests. Um, yeah, likewise. But yeah, okay, amazing. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, maybe we'll have you on in the future when you're when you're um, involved in the profit sharing community ecosystem a little bit more. We can kind of do a follow up in six months or something. Totally. Yeah. A parting message to viewers and, and founders building profit sharing communities is my DMs on Twitter are open. Um, and so hit me up and I, I think, you know, this is exactly the, the type of stuff that Variant wants to invest in. Amazing. And how can people find you on Twitter or anywhere else you, you want to uh, connect? So be- best place to go is variant.fund. That's the website. And from there you'll find all, all, all different ways of, of contacting me. But um, yeah, variant fund is, is the website. And um, um, uh, if you Google my name and Twitter, you'll, you'll find me there. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thanks so much for coming, Jesse. See you later. Okay, thanks for having me. This was fun. Bye.